Good morning, everybody. All right. I want to greet those of you who are watching our campuses today in New Milford and Derby and also in Waterbury. Uh, Greetings to you. And for those of you who are watching online today, uh, we welcome you as well. My name is Brian. For those of you who might be new, and if you are new today, whether you're tuning in online or you're in person in one of our campuses, we often say we believe the Lord has led you here. We truly believe that the Lord has led you here, that um, he has a word for you, and he wants you to encounter his presence today. So we're praying for that. If we can uh, tell you a little bit about the church or just meet you, please uh, send us a note. Or if you're in one of our campuses today, please come by and, and say hello. We'd love to meet you. We are in a theme year right now that we're calling Jesus. That's good. Every church should be in a, every year, in a year called Jesus, right? That's what what it's all about. That's why we're Christians, right? Uh, Because Jesus saved us, he redeemed us. Through the power of his spirit, he lives within us. Uh, This church is all about Jesus. That's what we're about. And uh, our hope this year is that we would go deeper in relationship with Jesus than we've ever gone before. Our our prayer is that we would just grow in intimacy with him in ways we've never done that before. We're praying that for you, praying that for myself, uh, that the result of really focusing in on Jesus uh, would be a deeper walk with him, amen? And so we are in a sermon series called Jesus Is, and this is the last week of that sermon series because next week, if you can believe it, is Advent. Yeah, I haven't even said Happy Thanksgiving yet. (laughs) Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Next weekend is Advent already as we approach uh, the Christmas season. But this last week, I want to focus on Jesus is our servant king. I'm praying that uh, this message would, uh, maybe for, for many of us, take one set of lenses off and put other lenses on. Because I believe that's what Jesus was trying to do in his earthly ministry for his disciples and all of his followers. He was constantly trying to take one set of lenses off of people and put on correct lenses. He was always trying to take off the kingdom of the world lenses and put on the, hey, hey, there's a different kingdom I'm trying to get you to lead here, the kingdom of God lenses. And that's what's going to happen in our passage here out of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 20 to 28. So thankful for our friends who read that today. I want to encourage you right now as I kind of begin this sermon to open the word to Matthew 20, verses 20 to 28. You can do that, a physical copy, much like this one, or on your phones, however you want to do that. Again, I want to keep encouraging you to bring the word of God with you. Uh, Don't just take my word for it, okay? Uh, Get in there with your own eyes and and look at it and ask the Lord to speak to you uh, as as I provide some teaching. You know, the question I want to start with today is this. What does it mean to be great? What does it mean to be great? And and, and maybe even more specifically, what makes a great person? What makes a great person? I I grew up and still do love hockey. That's why many of my analogies have to do with hockey. I'm sorry if you hate hockey. Um, I apologize for that. But one of the greatest players of all time, actually his nickname is The Great One, Wayne Gretzky. And I grew up watching Wayne Gretzky. I actually got to see Wayne Gretzky play in person. It was an amazing experience. And he's called the great one. Why is he called the great one? Well, here's the thing. I don't really know anything about his personal life. I don't know if he opens the door for his wife. I don't know if he's a gentleman. I don't know what his language is like. And so I don't call him the great one because of, well, his character necessarily. I call him the great one because of his accomplishments, This is where he got that nickname. He got the nickname because he scored 894 goals. Over his career, he had 1,963 assists. His total points were 2,857. The next closest hockey player was 936 points away from his total points. Nobody even comes close. And so his accomplishments make him the great one. You know, I think in our world, it's often our accomplishments that make us to be seen as great. 
who is great, the person in that position, the person who accomplished that thing, the person who won, they're the ones who are great. But what if God has designed us in a different way? What if we should be looking at things entirely different? I wonder, have you ever felt the pressure of being great? What is a great man? What is a great woman? Have you ever felt the weight of that pressure to be great, to have a great reputation, to have a great name, to have great impact, and it's, it's all resting on you? I've felt that pressure. Just a, a moment here of vulnerability. Throughout my life, I've always struggled with wanting to be seen as great. Started very early on as an athlete. I wanted to be seen as great. I wanted to score the most goals because I knew if I scored the most goals, I would be seen as the greatest. I wanted my name in the paper because then people would see that I was great. You know, sometimes I struggle because I want to be seen as a great pastor. I want to be seen as a great preacher. Somebody who has great impact in people's lives. And, and I have to battle with this because it's a pride issue, actually, to be seen as great. I want to be seen as a great husband, as a great father. I want to be seen as Great, and I would imagine that all of us at some level want to be seen as great. Seen as great. But what if we're using the wrong measuring tools? What if we're looking at it completely wrong? You see, the way that we measure greatness is by the number of followers and the number of likes The way we measure greatness is by the number of accomplishments or the number of awards, the number of compliments that we get about something or encouragements. Greatness in our world today depends on how well we're liked. It depends on the position that we occupy or the level of responsibility that we carry. But what if we've gotten it all wrong? What if we're measuring the wrong way? What if there's a completely different way to measure greatness? We often use this word champion. We always like to celebrate the champion. You know, you never go up after if you missed a a game or something, and you never go up to a friend and say, hey, 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 I gotta know, I gotta know, who was the runner-up, right? No, you never ask that. No, we forget who the runner-up is. I think it's Jerry Seinfeld who does this whole comedy bit on the Olympics and swimming. You know, the guy who wins is here, the guy who loses is here. You know, like, greatest person in the world, can, can never remember him. You know, like, don't even know his name, right? It's like inches, it's milliseconds. We always want to know who the champion is. And what is a champion? A champion is a person who defeats everyone else. A champion is a person who has risen above everyone else. And it's easy to want to be a champion. That's our pride. I want to rise above everyone else. I want to be seen as the greatest in my field, in the things God has even gifted me in. (laughs) Even the good gifts God gives us, I want to be seen as the greatest, the one who rises above everybody else. It's easy to want to be the champion, but what if God is calling us to something else? What if we were never meant to be the champion in the first place? What if we were never meant to be the best? What if we were never meant to be the greatest? See, friends, today what we're gonna learn is we're gonna learn about who we're called to be as modeled and demonstrated by Jesus himself. He's our perfect picture of how to live. And it's actually not to be a champion. It's to be a servant. It's not to rise above everyone. It's to raise up everyone. Do you see the difference? It's not to rise above everybody so we can say, oh, look at me. Look at me. I'm the greatest. 
I'm the greatest athlete. I'm the greatest pastor. I'm the greatest healer. I'm the greatest person with prophetic words. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest host. Look at me. No. What Jesus calls us to over and over and over again is to have a heart for others, to raise others up, that we might say, look, look how God has blessed you. Look how much God loves you. It's to come and to serve. But we live in a winning culture, don't we? It's not a serving culture. A lot of times we think we have to win. We've got to win. We've got to be the biggest. We've got to be the best. I have to win this argument. I even know that I'm wrong now, but, I, but I'm already down the tracks here, and so now I've got to finish it. I have to win. No! Let me tell you the truth about who we are in Christ Jesus. You have already won. <laughs> you have already won in Christ Jesus. Now our role is to invite people into this victory. And how does this happen? Not by trying to rise above people, not by having power over people. No, how do we invite people into the victory of Jesus? It happens by serving. And so here's the call today. The call is this, to lay down your need to be the greatest and pick up the call to serve wholeheartedly. What I wanna do with my remaining time is I wanna turn to Matthew 20, verses 20 to 28. Please, please get there with me. And I wanna provide some teaching on Matthew 20, 20 to 28. And then I wanna share two things I believe we need to lay down and one thing that we need to pick up. Let's turn to our passage, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, 20 to 28. It starts by saying, then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. Whenever you see the word then, therefore, uh, these kinds of words always look ahead to see what's happening. What's the context in which this mother is bringing these two disciples, James and John, before Jesus? A few things that I want to point out. In Matthew chapter 18, the disciples come to Jesus and ask Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? To answer this question, you can read the whole thing, but Jesus takes a child, brings them in their midst, and basically says, listen, you need to humble yourself like this child in order to be the greatest. Already, he's trying to take off their lenses and put on new lenses. You think it's this power over, you think it's this authority, you think it's being in these positions of power. No, 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 it's gonna happen differently in my kingdom. Come like a child in humility, and that's where you're gonna have the greatest impact. As you look through chapter 18, you're gonna see some other stories in here. You're gonna see the parable of the lost sheep. This is all about how God has the heart for the one. He's gonna go after that one. He's not just about the masses. He's about the one. He's about you. He loves you. You're gonna see a parable about the unforgiving debtor. This is a story about how one man is forgiven a debt and then he doesn't forgive another person. And, and, and Jesus is using this illustration to say, how can you receive something and not give it in return? He's trying to take off their lenses and put on a new lens. You see that unforgiving debtor was going back to the world standards. I'm going to rule it over my person because they haven't given me back my debt. No, 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 no. You've received forgiveness. Now give forgiveness. It's a new way of living. As you enter into chapter 19, you're going to see the story of the rich man who comes to Jesus and says, you know, what does it take to have eternal life? And Jesus says, hey, listen, this is what you need. He, he rattles off several of the commandments. And the man says, wow, that's great. I'm doing all these things. Then Jesus says, oh, wait a second. There's one more thing. You need to give all of your money to the poor. And this man goes away sad. Again, Jesus is trying to take the lenses off and put new lenses on, saying, listen, the way that you think the kingdom operates is not the way the kingdom operates. If you truly want life, you need to surrender your life to Jesus fully, 
fully. Now we come into chapter 20, and there's this great parable of the workers in the vineyard. You can read it on your own, but again, again, it's Jesus taking off their lenses, putting on new lenses. Hey, we were here all day working, and we got the same amount of money as the people who came and only worked for an hour. That's unfair. Not in the kingdom of God, it's not unfair. Why? Because God's heart is to save all people, no matter when they come. And they receive the same inheritance. And you shouldn't argue or, or, or anything about it because it's his to give anyway. Right? It's the taking off the lens. You know, we're not trying, you're not trying to build up your kingdoms. This is my kingdom, and this is how it works. Puts on new lenses. Now, right before our passage, for the third time, Jesus says this. Hey, listen, friends. We're going to Jerusalem. People are getting excited now. Wow, we're going to Jerusalem This probably means that we're going into Jerusalem so that we can overturn the Roman Empire. Finally, the Messiah, Jesus, we we know he's the Messiah. Now we know he's going in there and he's gonna take the earthly thrones and he's going to rule and lead on this earth. This is gonna be fantastic, we can't wait. Jesus, we're going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. Wait a second, you're gonna die? This doesn't seem to make sense, but we're gonna stick with this. Keep talking, Jesus. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna be crucified. I'm gonna be buried. You're gonna be buried? Okay, what's happening here? But then, on the third day, I'm gonna rise from the dead. Okay, fantastic. So he's gonna live, so that means he is gonna overtake the Romans, and we're gonna have those powerful positions. Now comes to our passage, then. You're thinking to yourself right now, if Brian took that much time on one word then, this sermon's gonna go forever, right? But we're gonna move on. I can feel your concern, okay? (laughs) I feel it, I acknowledge it, and uh, let's move on. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. Now, I don't know if you've ever had your parent (laughs) bring you before a teacher or somebody like that, and you're kind of like standing in the background like embarrassed by this. I'm not quite sure that's the scenario. In, In Mark's gospel, actually, we see that it's just James and John. But here, you know, their mother brings them before Jesus. Now, an interesting family connection here. Most likely, this is a woman named Salome, who is the mother of James and John. Salome is also the sister of a person named Mary. Ah, Mary is the mother of? Oh, come on, folks, I've not been teaching well enough, right? I mean, we're coming right into the Christmas story. Like, Mary has a pretty foundational place in the whole thing here, right? Like without, so, so Mary is the mother of? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus, right? And so what you have here is you have Jesus' aunt and his cousins coming before him. Right, And so so that's what's happening. Came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. I like this posture because in one sense we need to commend Salome, James, and John because they're kneeling before Jesus. This is acknowledgement that he is the Messiah, that he is about to do something great. So we commend them for that. And I love Jesus. He says, what is your request, he asked. Does this sound familiar? Mark 10, we, 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 we see Jesus, and he, he says something very similar. He says, what do you need? What do you need from me? He says this to the blind man, right? And, and so here again, he's saying, what is your request? And this is the posture of our Lord, friends. He wants to know what your request is. What's on your heart? And I love how Salome is very honest. She replied, in your kingdom, now she's thinking about this earthly kingdom, In your kingdom, I know we're headed to Jerusalem, so in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. She wants her two sons to have these positions of authority in Jerusalem. I love how Jesus, he he answers her with grace, and this is our Jesus. He says, but Jesus answers by saying to them, you don't know what you are asking Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? This is another way to say this. This is what Jesus is asking. Are you able to do things my way? I I mean, look at, I only went back to chapter 18. Go all the way back to chapter one. You're gonna see Jesus doing this all over, trying to take off their lenses and put on his lenses. Listen, are, are you really, do you really think that you're going to be able to do things my way. Because even you standing in front of me right now is an acknowledgement that you're trying to do things your way. You want these positions of honor. Now in one sense though, this wasn't an outlandish request. 
In one sense, you can see through the Gospels that Jesus had already chosen James and John in a special way. Peter, James, and John were the three that were invited to come out on the Mount of Transfiguration. And so maybe Salome is saying, hey, listen, you've already kind of chosen my kids to be the special ones, you know? And so can't you just put them in those two seats of honor? And I love how the two answer Jesus. Are you able to drink from this bitter cup? And, and quickly they say, oh, yes, they replied. We are able. But again, they're thinking about what's to come from their standpoint. Yeah, yeah, of course, we, we just, we want to be put in those spots. We know when we're put in those spots, we're going to be seen as great. We'll do whatever it takes, Jesus, to be put in those spots. They're not thinking yet about the kind of kingdom Jesus is ushering in and the level of persecution that's going to come because of it. Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My Father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. Just a quick word about this. Remember Jesus, Jesus is God, full stop. There's no hierarchy in the Trinity. Jesus is God. But what Jesus is doing in his earthly ministry is he's demonstrating and showing to his people what it looks like to follow God. And so oftentimes you'll see Jesus submitting to the Father. Why? So that you and I will know how to live. That's why. He is God, but he's showing you this is what it means. Listen, these aren't my spots to give. It's been decided by our Father in heaven. Submit and surrender to him. That's the way to live in this life. And then I love this. If Jesus were gracious, there were some people who weren't gracious with these two. When the 10 other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. Why were they so upset? Was it because they understood the ways of the kingdom and they knew exactly what Jesus was doing? I don't think so. I think they were upset because they didn't get their first. <laughs> How dare you go above us? And think of Peter. He's like, I was there with you on the Mount of Transfer. You didn't even bring me. How dare you try to take these spots without consulting us? Jesus sees this as an opportunity, and so he calls all of his disciples together, and he says this, you know that rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. What Jesus is about to do here is he's about to contrast two kingdoms. And so the first kingdom looks like this. Rulers in this world lord it over their people. But then in verse 26, I love this phrase, but among you it will be different. Friends, as Christ followers among us, it has to be different. We are called to be set apart Different, different than our world. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. You see, what Jesus is doing here is he's saying there's two styles. There's the style of this world where when people get in positions of authority, they rule it over others. But then there's my style. And my style is to be a servant. To not have power over but to come under and lift up. And let me um, share a couple insights into this. A couple things that, that are just really relevant for us today. A couple things I wanna challenge you with. I said at the beginning, I believe the Lord wants us to lay down two things and pick up one thing. Let me be specific about that. And I love, before I say that, I love how Jesus models this perfectly for us. When he calls us to be a servant, it's not something he hasn't done already. Jesus models what it looks like to serve one another perfectly. When you look at his life through the Gospels, you see every person who came to him asking for prayer, he prayed for. <laughs> he healed. He delivered people. I'm sure he got exhausted, yet he served people when they came to him. I don't know how many times maybe when people come to us or we see people, we think to ourselves, I don't have the time or I don't want to deal with that. <laughs> Jesus, I would imagine if you were following Jesus, you would say each and every day, my goodness, 
This, this man is, is stopping and he's, he's serving and he's bowing down and he's, he's helping and he's praying for so many people. He's taking the posture of a servant. He modeled it so well. He served the most vulnerable, the outcasts of society. When he brought his disciples into the upper room, he washed their feet. And I always like to say, all of their feet. Everyone who was in that room, even the one he knew would betray him, he washed his feet too. That's our model. That's what it looks like to follow him. And it goes even further than that because a few days after that upper room experience, Jesus would go to the cross. And this is the perfect picture of what it means to lay down our life for others. Our, our Savior has done it for us. He didn't use his power to oppress but instead, he used his power to free us who were held captive. So what is Jesus saying to us today? First, I believe Jesus is saying, lay down your need to get your way. You see, these three believers, they wanted their will, not God's will. They wanted it their way. And Jesus had just spoken about the cross. Just passages earlier, he was speaking about the cross. But what James and John wanted, they wanted the crown, and so often we forget that the way that we are to live is the way of the cross, not the crown. This is who we're called to be. They wanted a throne. When you look throughout scripture, desiring a throne never fared well with God. <laughs> he never really wanted man to sit on a throne in the first place. Before that, Satan sought a throne and he was cast out of heaven. Satan would then tempt Jesus with an earthly throne and Jesus would refuse it. There's only one throne and it's already occupied. Jesus was once again trying to teach that the way of the kingdom does not look like the way of this world. His disciples would need to lay down their way in order to live his way. And so as we hear this, my question for all of us is how about you? Are you trying to push your will right now, your agenda? Are you trying to do things your way or his way? Another way that the Lord convicted me this week was he asked me, Brian, what is your life communicating to me? And so let me make it personal for you. What is your life communicating to Jesus? The way that you're living your life, what is it saying to Jesus? The words you're choosing to use, the posture you're choosing to go to others, what is it saying to Jesus? Is it saying, hey, listen, I've heard about your way, but Jesus, I've got a better way. <laughs> I've got a quicker way. I've got a way that's going to serve my needs more. Or is your life communicating to Jesus, hey, Jesus, listen, I don't always understand. I don't always get it, but I'm 100% following you, completely surrendered. Second thing that we need to lay down, lay down your need to be the greatest. Now listen, this is not a laying down of working hard. <laughs> this is not a, a laying down excellence. I actually think Christ followers should do things with excellence. That actually in our workplaces, in our homes, people should look at us and say, we want them around. Because everything they put their hand to, they do with, with real excellence. Uh, so that's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying down is we need, to, we need to lay down the pressure to be the greatest. To lay down the fight for first place. And look through a new lens. You see, James and John wanted those two seats because then everyone would see them in the places of honor. Those seats represented power. They represented authority. They represented privilege. They represented prestige. Those seats represented winning. And they wanted to win. And I think we experience this kind of pressure as well. This pressure to be the greatest. Pressure to be the greatest parent. Pressure to be the greatest in the workplace. The greatest, smartest person in the room the greatest, the most popular in our schools. This pressure to be liked, 
this pressure, the greatest, to be, to be as wealthy as we can, the greatest mentally and physically and emotionally. I must win the greatest Christian. I think in our world there's this real pressure that people feel that I have to be the greatest Christian, the greatest Bible reader, the greatest prayer, the greatest leader, the greatest follower of Jesus, always trying to measure up. But here's what I wanna do for you today is I wanna make it very plain and very simple. The call is not to be the greatest. The call is to serve. Serve the Lord. He is the greatest. (laughs) That position is already taken and serve one another. Let me relieve the pressure. You're not the greatest. (laughs) Look at a loved one, not a stranger, because that's just rude, but look at a loved one right now and just say, you're not the greatest. No, you're not the greatest. That, That title is occupied and not by Wayne Gretzky. Right? Jesus is the greatest. Your role is to serve and follow him. That's what your role is. Finally, what do we need to pick up? We need to pick up the call to serve. I love how Jesus says, among you, it will be different. It has to be different. If we want to reach people for Jesus, it has to be different. If we want to to see the power of Jesus on display, it has to be different. We have to be humble people who are ready and willing to serve all people. If we take cues from the world, we will love only those who we find it easy to love and we'll cancel the rest. If we take cues from the world, we'll run over people in order to get promoted. We'll speak badly about others to make ourselves look better. We'll use power to control, manipulate, and hurt others for our gain. In the name of good things, even, and good causes, we'll hurt one another. We'll lord it over others, and we'll use our authority to oppress others. But Jesus says, among you, it will be different. It has to be different. We will serve one another. We will forgive one another. We will sacrifice for one another. We will not abuse our power we will empower others. We will not look for opportunities to rise above. We will look for every opportunity to raise up. So here's my question for you today. At a very practical level, who is God calling you to serve? I love that right after our passage, always good to look at what happens right after our passage, and Jesus saying, hey, listen, you need to be a servant, you need to be a slave to all, you need to be one who comes underneath and sacrifices and loves other people. Directly after that, Jesus goes, and he's before two real people, and he serves those two real people, and he heals them right on the spot. I love that about our Jesus. He doesn't just say, hey, be servant of all, and then he goes out And right in front of a real person, he serves that person. And so, who is God calling you to serve? I want you to think real practically about that. Put a name into that. Who is God calling you to serve right now? Is it your neighbor? Is it a family member? Is it somebody over this Thanksgiving holiday that maybe you'd like to avoid, but God is actually calling you to serve, to love, to encourage, to write a note to, to give some money to, whatever it might be, serve them, sacrifice for them to demonstrate and show the love of God. Last thing I wanna say is this, is that I'm so thankful for the church because it gives us opportunities to serve. And there's so many great places and people to serve in the life of the church. Praise God that this church is reaching out into our communities. Praise God that this church is investing in our children and youth. Praise God that every week we get to come together and worship together. There are so many places for us to lend a hand. And when we serve, we actually begin to belong to something. And so I want to encourage you, if you're not serving in the life of the church right now, or maybe because of COVID you were serving but you got out of the habit of it, I want to encourage you and challenge you to begin again. It's time now to to come together 
and serve one another, to serve our communities. And a very practical way to do that is to go to the website, walnuthillcc.org, and click that Serve tab. And I wanna encourage you to fill out the form, and we will get back to you, and we will talk to you about opportunities for you to get plugged in, to serve our children, to serve in our care ministries, to greet one another as people come in, to serve in our production teams. There's so many opportunities to serve one another in the body of Christ. Hey, friends, my prayer in all of our campuses uh, that this would be a lens-changing moment for us and that we would put on the lenses of the kingdom of God and that we would drop, <laughs> in humility, we would drop our need to be the greatest. and Instead, we would pick up the lenses of servant and begin to see the world that way. It changes everything when you look through the lenses of servant. That, that tough conversation looks completely different when you're looking through the lenses of serving. Our family lives, our, our, our marriages, they look completely different when we put it through the lenses of how can I serve? How can I raise up? And I pray that as we go into this Thanksgiving week that we would put those lenses on. I pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.